Happy New Year, everyone. Happy 2015 uh, to you and your families. I trust that you had a wonderful uh, holiday, uh, festivities and activity around the holidays. And also, I trust that you have had actually a very uh, meaningful and successful 2014. You've spent the last probably three to four months <laughs> working on a lot of business opportunities for December and January, working on your current clients' renewals, uh, just like we have here at PrimePay, and uh, so we know that you have been extremely busy, um, not only just uh, preparing for your year end, but also planning here for 2015. And so we are thrilled to have you. Let me introduce myself. My name is Steve Jackson. I'm the Senior Vice President of Strategic Development and Channel Sales, and I want to welcome you uh, to the webinar here today. Um, as we think about 2015 and the new year, uh, would be a little remiss not to thank you um, for your business with Prime pay here in 2014, um, we rely so heavily on our broker partners, our benefit consultants that have teamed up with us over certainly last year but years prior, and we can't thank you enough for the trust that you have uh, put on us with your clients. And we are thrilled to look at even greater opportunities and drive more revenue for you and helping your clients hopefully achieve a lot of this uh, compliance Mm, administration, you know, I don't want to say nightmare, but you know, just issues and concerns that they're going to have to deal with. We are thrilled to be a part of that. So as, in thinking about the new year, um, this is, we are entering or beginning our eighth year of um, actually holding these monthly broker webinars. Uh, we've been holding this on the first Wednesday of every month, and we've had a specific mission. Um, the mission is this, uh, we want to deliver rich content to you in about an hour um, or less. You know, some of you go, Steve, look, I've attended your webinars, it's an hour or slightly more. <laughs> so it's a New Year's resolution, I'm going to try to work on that. Uh, but uh, about an hour's worth. But the main goal is this, we can take ACA language, rules, regulations, requirements, all of these guidelines that have been imposed, but we need to find a way to practically be able to deliver this, you, to your clients, right? I mean, the employers ultimately have to deal with it and work in it. And so we want to take the opportunity with each one of these webinars so that you can actually take that content and be able to to go immediately to your clients and have a real business conversation about those specific topics. And so today's topic is no different. Uh, ACA has given us a, a plethora of, of, <laughs> of content uh, to talk about here over the last four to five years, and, and this month is no different. Um, and I can tell from the, at least the energy around the registration of this webinar, as it's going to be probably one of our most widely attended webinars here actually in our history, that this topic is actually pretty near and dear, that this is something that your employers are talking about, and we are going to take a very um, uh, rich dive into this content, and I hope when you walk away from this that you're going to be able to deliver a very solid conversation uh, to your clients. So there's a lot of new faces on this webinar here today, and um, so just to give you some logistics, um, everybody's phones are muted, um, but, I, but I don't want to not hear from you. Um, every slide is going to have a lot of content on it, and as you have specific questions, I want you to ask it. So if you would, go into the GoToMeeting menu bar. Go ahead and type in your question, submit it to us. What we do then is this, in our follow-up email uh, to you, we're going to provide you a copy of the slide deck, so you're going to get a presentation slide deck of what I'm showing you here today. Our, we record each of these webinars, and they're actually hosted or posted to our Broker Concierge YouTube site, and I'll give you the link here at the end, I think it's on my last slide. And, and But that's right in YouTube. Go to Broker Concierge, and we post all of our webinars there. Look for that posting to occur somewhere around Friday, maybe Monday at the latest, but, but that will be there here in a couple days. Um, we're also going to accumulate all of your questions, and we are going to be um, answering those questions. And in our follow-up email to you, we will provide you an FAQ of all the questions. And I think that has been... Um, you know, brokers have told us time and time again that that is, is so useful to hear the other questions, see the other questions that everyone is asking. So we're going to accumulate that and then provide that to you. So we can't thank you enough for taking time. I mean, here it is, January 7th, 2015. Can't thank you enough for taking the time to sit with me here today and go over this important topic. So let's, let's go over the agenda here uh, today. 
Um, before we get right into the content, I always want to try to bring just uh, uh, one or two things or so to light. And I thought what would be helpful as we kick off the new year is we get common questions about kind of a quick guide or a checklist or, you know, what are some of the key things that we really should be focusing our energy on with our clients, you know, brokers keep telling us, listen, we're sitting down, not just talking about the health benefit renewal, we're talking about so much more because so much more is needed from ERISA and, and uh, you know, from HHS and ACA and tax and, and all of these different things, and you guys are getting involved. So we developed a quick guide, compliance checklist, and I would like to briefly, yes, briefly go over that checklist uh, with you before we get started into our main, uh, you know, content for today. So. What is the purpose of this information reporting? Um, let's dive into that. We then will go into that responsibility. Who is ultimately responsible um, for this reporting, okay, of this new data? What information is needed? When is it due? And certainly, is there a possibility of any penalty exposure um, in regard to this information reporting? We need to know about that. So we're going to cover every little bit of detail in regard to the information reporting here today. And then lastly, and actually probably throughout, honestly, we're, we are going to be talking, I am going to be bringing up different um, ideas in regard to communicating, gathering the information uh, that's needed, bring some practical use to how are you involved? How is your client involved? How is someone like PrimePay or a payroll provider involved? Is it really um, just the employer's sole responsibility? I don't know. I, I see very much a team effort here. So let's kind of talk through what that might look like. So there's a tremendous amount of information here. We're going to go ahead and get started here on the compliance checklist. So let's look at a quick guide for you. I hope that this will be helpful. I'm going to go over actually 10 items, okay? But we're going to do it quickly. So if you would, go ahead and take your notes as needed, and I'm going to kind of rifle through these uh, in a relatively quick fashion, okay? The first one here is, uh, you know, that you need to talk about it, and these are things that um, it may not come up in everyday discussion. Maybe you've had a lot of these discussions with your current clients already, but you've not had an ability. Maybe you have a new client that you just brought on January 1st, and but you've not yet been able to have a deeper dive into some things. So this, this little quick guide, this checklist, is really just to get you kind of focused on the key items, kind of the key compliance items that you should be discussing. There's, <laughs> there's, there's plenty others, right? I mean, you need to talk about so many other things, but these 10 items um, I think are very important to discuss, and it can open up some real strong dialogue uh, with your clients. So this first one is something that's been around, right? Due to ACA, we've got grandfathered, uh, grandmothered, you know, all types of statuses here. But I just want to touch on this a little bit, depending on the stage of communication that you're having with your clients. You know, you still should evaluate grandfather status. You know, you need to determine whether you have made changes or the client has made changes to the plan that either has reduced benefits in some form or fashion or has possibly increased the cost to employees and dependents enrolled in that coverage, which could result in the loss of grandfathered status. So you do need to think about, maybe it's more of those prospects that you're, you're speaking with, or those new clients, or what have you, uh, a BOR change that might have occurred. I mean, this, this is still a very solid discussion to have. So if the plan loses grandfathered status, you're going to want to make sure that the plan design and the benefits that are offered you know, reflect all of the ACA requirements. Now, if the plan remains grandfathered, please make sure you do this. You need to provide a notice of grandfathered status. So um, and whenever you provide a summary of plan benefits to participants and beneficiaries, you want to make sure that that notice is attached. Okay, so evaluating grandfather status. You still have, we still have groups out there that have that status and, and certainly not going to affect the lion's share maybe of your groups, but certainly a, a, a still a portion, you know, of that. Plan documentation, you know, this is getting actually pretty, uh, pretty serious actually in regard to language and amendments and information that the employer needs to 
add or amend to existing plan documentation. Now, when I mentioned plan documentation, there's, there's Section 125 plans, there's health and welfare benefit plan documentation, there's ERISA, um, and you can kind of, the list goes on and on, right? So I just want to focus on a couple things. When you immediately think of plan documentation and health and welfare benefits, you kind of go right to the, the quick items, right, the waiting period. Um, does your client, in the documentation that they have, so from ERISA um, to just standard documents, certificates of coverage that they would have from the carrier, do they all state the same thing? Um, we have run, in our ERISA service, we've run into many instances where one document says one thing and the other says another. So the, the client had gone and had made the corrections in one document, but they failed to do it in another. So that, that's a great conversation. It's, it's just, hey, I mean, when's the last time, client, have you done a review of your documentation for simple things as simple as, do you make sure that you don't have a waiting period that exceeds 90 days, right? Uh, the other items um, that can also be in consideration is just no annual dollar limits, right? I mean, you just want to make sure that that, that documentation, um, as covered under the essential health benefits, that, that it's stated that way, and also verifying that the pre-existing condition exclusions, you know, are, are all in place as well. And those are those are pretty simple things. Now. For ERISA, you want to think about ERISA um, and documentation. When's the last time has that employer actually provided a summary plan description to its employees, an ERISA SPD to its employees? Great conversation starter. I would say three-quarters of your clients are not doing it, so that's a good, good start. For non-grandfathered group health plans, you know, when you talk about small group plans, you want to make sure, or insure, and I would say at this point it probably is, confirm that the plan covers essential health benefits, right, okay? You also want to ensure that the annual out-of-pocket cost uh, for coverage of all essential health benefits, uh, you know, provided in network, does not exceed 6,600 for self-coverage or 13,200 for self-only coverage uh, for plan years beginning in 2015. So, so then, you know, so there are some key things that you could focus on in plan documentation, and it's really finding consistency of language, but it's also in distribution of those documents to the employees. Those are two great conversations um, that you can have. Another key item here is tax. Um, tax favored arrangements such as HRAs, you know, a most of the HRAs, many of your clients have HRAs, most of the HRAs are used in conjunction with the group health plan, okay, um, of, uh, you know, so of the major medical plan that's being offered. So generally speaking, it is integrated, but you do want to look for those specific situations, maybe it's with a prospect or someone you're, you know, going after as far as maybe new business. Uh, you want to see if an HRA is actually out there as a standalone, okay? If it's a retire, you know, if it falls under one of the accepted benefits, it's fine. But I would say primarily you're going to want to see that the HRA is integrated with a major group health plan that is compliant with ACA, okay? So, and, and so look at that integration. I think that overall integration is pretty important, um, you know, at least to have. Um, the next thing then, too, is the use of premium reimbursement accounts. So as you think about a flexible spending plan and a premium reimbursement account or an HRA that in the past was reimbursing individual medical premiums, I believe that by the end of 2014, we all feel a little more comfortable that um, the use of an HRA or a premium reimbursement account in an FSA or a Section 125 plan is prohibited for individual medical policies, but for the accepted benefits like dental, vision, and so forth. So, um, you know, again, just it's a good review. We still run into situations where employers have been uh, reimbursing individual medical premiums, so just a good discussion to have uh, to ensure that they're doing things the right way. Section 125 plans. So as you get into Section 125, I'm just speaking primarily of a premium-only plan, okay, um, you know, so a, kind of a true cafeteria plan. So just a, a couple things to think about. In the last year, there have been actually a couple amendments that have been needed for Section 125. 
You see, most of your employers will actually, um, they will actually uh, probably, they'll, they'll get a POP plan, a Section 125 plan, you know, they bought it, you know, implemented it years ago, and they haven't really looked at it since. But there's been several amendments due to ACA, and one of those is, that just occurred here last year, was that language can be added to the 125 plan to allow an employee to make additional mid-year changes in salary reduction elections in the event that that employee enrolls in coverage in the health insurance marketplace, in healthcare.gov, or, or any individual medical insurance. So, but, but actually, with that one is, is the health insurance marketplace. So language needs to be added to the 125 plan in order for that to happen. Now, an employer in their right mind, I'd say, yeah, you would want to add it. So that's a good conversation. You're going to want to ask that question if they have amended that based on mid-year election changes for those employees enrolling in the health insurance marketplace plans. Secondly, um, under the prohibitions of um, some of the ACA language that came out last year, it stated that Section 125 plans cannot be used to pre-tax individual medical premiums. So there is specific language that would need to be amended in the Section 125 plan that would prohibit a qualified health plan so an individual medical plan or healthcare.gov, you know, enrolled plan, um, that you cannot offer that as a pre-tax benefit under that cafeteria plan. So those two things under Section 125, very important, I think, for you to, uh, to, to look at, okay, and discuss. Flexible spending, some key things here with flexible spending that have really taken hold. Um, if your client is not offering a group health plan, a major medical plan, an ACA compliant plan, they will not be able to offer an FSA or at least a health FSA, okay, that would not be considered an accepted benefit. So. I'd say for most of you, you're, you're working with clients that have group health plans. So, so generally speaking, yes, they're going to be able to offer an FSA. Um, not to dig too much into the weeds, but, but you do want to ask the questions if employers are providing a contribution, an employer contribution to that health FSA. And I want you to make sure that that employer contribution is either one of these two things. Either the employer contribution is no more than $500, a fixed amount of $500, or two, the employer contribution is no greater than a one-for-one -one match, okay, a matching contribution of one-for-one. -one. As long as you hold or, or, or retain the employer contribution in that facet, you're great. That's an accepted benefit. You're fine. Okay. Anything outside of that scope, you go into the realm of a non-accepted benefit and can run into issues. Okay. So just want to offer that. Um, secondly here, just in regard to thinking about FSAs and discussion around that, make sure that your employer knows that the maximum election for an employee to make in their health FSA did go up here in 2015 to $2,550 from the $2,500 here uh, previously that has been listed. And lastly, and I, and I, and I encourage you all to, to talk to your clients about it, um, employers should be adopting the $500 rollover provision for their FSA. Now is the time. No, no need to wait. Um, they should be incorporating that into their plan. So that's a great discussion. Why? Because the $500 rollover will not only increase the number of participants in the plan, but it will also actually um, increase the amount of contributions, which is going to save the employer more money and certainly save the employees' uh, monies there as well. Employee notices. Um, as we kind of rifle through these, I, you, we could probably spend um, a, a full hour just on notices. But I want you to think about just some key notices here. Uh, not only do you have ERISA and, and other maybe ACA types of notices, but, but the one that comes to mind is the written notice of the exchange notice, right? So the employer exchange notice. And employers have within 14 days of the employee's start date uh, that time to actually send that notice to the employee or provide that notice to the employee. Now, the DOL, Department of Labor, has, has basically said, hey, we're not necessarily enforcing that at this time. Okay, all right, so maybe there's not a specific penalty um, that applies, but clearly um, they're going to want to see in any audit um, some due diligence in that area. So the exchange notice to the employees 
Um, that should be given within 14 days of the new hire start date. Another key thing that I want to mention as far as employee notices um, is the summary of benefit coverage. You know, that the summary of benefit co coverage uh, notice, the SBC, has gotten a lot of, um, um, uh, I guess, just time here recently in the legislature just coming up with more confirmation as far as changes to the SBC. Um, and what you want to make sure is not only did that employer receive the necessary SBC from the carrier, but did they also distribute it, <laughs> okay? Uh, it's one thing receiving it, but are they distributing it to not only their current employees, but you know, new hires as they come in? So just make sure that your clients are distributing those notices as they should to their employees on a timely, timely basis. The employer mandate, um, you know, this in and of itself is a, is a whole new webinar, but just some key things that I want to touch on here. Um, most of your clients are, I hope, as they have entered into 2015, understand that um, there was another kind of transition plan for the employer mandate, but I hope that your employers do understand that as of right now, as of 2015, the employer mandate is live. Okay, but but it but it changed, right? So instead of the 50 plus or 50 or more um, in full-time employees and/or equivalents for 2015, it is uh, 100 or more full-time employees and/or equivalents. Okay, um, but. In order to determine whether they are a large employer or an applicable large employer, they needed to take or they may take any six consecutive month period in 2014 to determine that status. So the first thing is knowing for sure whether you are on the bubble, you are, you know, are or are not um, subject under the employer shared provisions uh, within this employer mandate. So the large employer status, big deal. Now, this also applies to non-calendar year plans, so it's not just January 1 plans. Um, if the employer is, is considered a large employer based on their findings in 2014, but their plan year is March 1st, well, all right, then the employer mandate is going to start kicking in for them in regard, uh, at that time of that plan year, okay? So March 1st is when that would start. So you also need to just determine, too, whether you're going to pay or play. Um, questions to ask and really dig into as a broker and consultant is really finding out, listen, employer, are you providing, um, you know, the minimum value coverage? Are you making it affordable? You know, do we have potential penalties that will ensue? Um, do we have variable hour employees that, uh, you know, could come into play here? So all of those things are going to come into play in regard to the employer mandate. Today, number nine, I am going to be talking about information reporting. So um, you are not going to need to worry <laughs> about information on that because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive uh, directly into that specific uh, uh, compliance guide piece. The number 10, I, I snuck in a few more. Um, so the 10 is kind of a grab bag, but it's just some key things that I think you should have on your plate as you're talking with your clients. Um, you know, the first one here that I just kind of came to mind for me was the medical loss ratio, the rebates. Um, you know, some of your clients have, have had that exposure. Not everybody has had that exposure. So you're going to run into new instances potentially each year in regard to those rebates. So, you know, you want to talk to your client about how those rebates should be distributed, um, you know, appropriately distributed uh, to, you know, to the enrollees. Um, you know, rebates are generally due by September 30th uh, here in 2015. And um, so that, again, is a good conversation to have because what we found is that's always created a lot of confusion uh, in regard to what to do with those specific rebates. The PCORI fee, um, PCORI, the Patient Centered Outcome Research Institute fee, uh, generated certainly or created um, on behalf of creating some revenue, <laughs> on behalf of, of ACA. Um, but nonetheless, as most of you are aware, uh, employers that sponsor certain self-insured health plans, and that includes HRAs, um, are responsible for fees. And uh, this last year, the fee was $2, and that now goes up to $2.08. So it's gone up by $0.08 cents here as we come into this new year. Um, and that payment is due by July 30th or 31st um, of the following year. Okay, so by July 31st of this year, that next payment is going to need to, to be made. 
Next is HPID, health plan um, identification numbers. You know, this is going to affect your smaller employers this year. Um, the first HPID health plan identification um, requirement started here November 5, 2014 for large employers, but most of your employer clients will need to um, obtain their HPID by November 5th of 2015. So what is it? Uh, basically HIPAA, high tech, ACA, they've all required standardization for all health plans. And so all health plans are going to require this 10-digit number. And, and that's what this HPID, health plan identifier, uh, is going to be. So I don't have the time to dive into that here today, but that is something that is going to, uh, will have to be obtained by your clients here uh, as we uh, get closer to November of this year. W-2 reporting, there's no significant changes here for employers that have 250 or more issued W-2s in 2014. Okay, and it's W-2s, it's not benefit eligible or benefit enrolled, it's, it's total W-2s issued, that those employers will need to um, submit uh, the, or uh, it's, they're required to put the employer-sponsored premiums uh, directly on the W-2, and that, that is something that has not, um, you know, really significantly changed at all here over the last uh, a uh, couple years. Uh, reinsurance fee, the, the transitional reinsurance program fee was also something that was uh, created due to ACA uh, in, in light of trying to drive some additional revenue for the program. This is for one, uh, something that actually will be removed over a, um, I think it's three to three, four year period, um, but the first payment was made here last year or at the end of last year and, and that was $63 per covered life and uh, there will be an additional payment here or another payment, subsequent payment, uh, here in 2015. So, so that is still here. Uh, I was looking here at my notes. I don't have the number, the dollar amount for this year. Um, you're handy, actually. But last year's amount was $63 per covered life, and that does go down. It is reduced uh, this year. I just don't have that number. So we, we can get that for you, though. The last thing then is the health care tax credit. You know, one of the things that I just want to mention with this, uh, this does not apply to a lot of your clients, but it is a great conversation to have with your smaller um, businesses. Um, you know, this applies to businesses that have, on average, you know, it's left fewer than 25 employees, um, have average annual wages of $50,000, you know, and certainly or less, and you have a tax credit, and you can only receive the tax credit if the employer goes and enrolls in benefits um, through the shop, you know, through the small business exchange. Um, and, um, but, but it's a great conversation because for you, it's showing that you're doing your due diligence in trying to seek the best, um, you know, credit, uh, saving the client money. I mean, you're doing, um, you know, you're trying to go above and beyond. And I think that it's a great conversation to certainly have in regard to the healthcare tax credit. So that's a lot, right? I mean, I spent about um, 15 minutes here, 10, 15 minutes, just really kind of quickly going over that. Each one of these can carry actually a, a solid conversation, I think, um, with your clients depending on, you know, just the stage that they're in. And uh, so hopefully that is, is helpful to kind of think about kind of these key 10, eh, really 15, 16 <laughs> items that you can actually, uh, you know, talk through uh, with your clients. All right. So let's dive into the meat of information reporting. Um, I don't know if your employers are ready for it. Um, I can't sit here and say, are you ready for it, right? I mean, that's why we're here. Uh, we want to make sure you are, and I, I hope by the end of this um, I'm going to make you ready. Um, but I think a lot of employers, um, because some of the forms and information is still in draft form, so as of this date, um, we are still, the forms that are published right now are in draft form, so it is not final. But I will say the information that I'm covering today is, is pretty close. I mean, I, there, I can't see any real significant changes um, in regard um, to the data that's required so far for information reporting. So you might be thinking about um, a little bit kind of what is the purpose and so just to lay a groundwork, because your clients are probably going to ask this question. And um, so I want you to think about two things, right? So we have the individual mandate, we have the employer mandate. The IRS um, is the enforcer 
of verifying and also enforcing those specific items. And so, you know, if an individual goes to healthcare.gov and they, due to their, you know, their status, their federal poverty level, you know, they qualify for a subsidy for a premium credit, well, what the IRS wants to confirm and verify, well, do you, are you also offered creditable coverage, you know, through an affordable coverage through your employer? Because if so, you're not eligible for a subsidy, right? So there's got to be this verification in order for them to actually enforce appropriately. So, so really the purpose of this information reporting is to actually provide for just mandate consistency, okay, for both the individual and the employer, all right? And um, so that's really the main emphasis here is to actually, if you think about it, the data that is provided will greatly help the employer to, to not receive penalties, but it will also help an individual not receive penalties as well. And um, so th there is a great purpose behind it, but there's certainly a lot of, of effort in the administration, and that's really what we want to cover here today. All right, so as we go into the purpose, what, I have, um, what I've tried to do here is break this down, um, I hope, in a format that you really completely understand, okay? Uh, so I've taken what the IRS has produced and certainly others and, and just tried to bring it down into a nice, easy uh, piece for you. So I have broken it down into 6055 and 6056, so under ACA. Uh, the Internal Revenue Code, um, Section 6055 and 6056, were in essence uh, created. It was born, okay? And, and this covers these sections of the code because of the enforcement actions, verification and enforcement actions, provide the details in regard to, to what is the requirement, okay, um, for employers and or providers. Um, and, and so in breaking this down, um, I first am covering here 6055. So, so what is the kind of the purpose of 6055? So the first year is ACA added that every provider of minimum essential coverage will report coverage information. So every provider, so that is fully insured plans, it's self-insured plans, it's every provider, providers that uh, you get through healthcare.gov, through the shop exchange, uh, whatever it may be, okay? There's two things, and you'll see two key things, I'll call them action items in regard to 6055, and you'll see the same on 6056. You must file an individual return, so sometimes that's called, if you think about that, that's, that's a... It's like your tax return. That's a, another word for it is a transmittal, but it's a, it's a, you're filing an individual return, okay? But you're also, uh, that uh, re additional requirement is that you must furnish a statement to individuals. So you have a component with, it, with this entire process where you're filing, you're submitting information to the IRS. Okay, so think about your normal tax return, you know, types of filing. But then you're also furnishing a statement directly to those individuals, all right? Now, 6055 is specific to, dis uh, to, to enforce minimum essential coverage. So, so it's really centered around the compliance with the individual mandate, all right? So 6055 is focused on the individual mandate, really focused on those providers um, of minimum essential coverage, okay? So keep that in mind here. And I'll kind of keep reiterating here this uh, as we go along. All right, so let's shift now. Um, this is 6056. So, um, so look at the top there. So this is 6056. Now, now what does this particular section of the code really focus on? Okay, so this um, ACA requires all applicable large employers, ALE, that they will report coverage information, okay? So 6056 is specific to applicable large employers. So think about 2015, we're kind of in this transitional year. Um, which employers of yours have been determined to be an applicable large employer? That's employers with 100 
or more full-time employees and or equivalents, okay? So um, just applicable large employers, not small employers, all right? We'll get to some of that here. The two action items under 6056 is very similar, might be worded slightly different, but it's, it's similar. They must file an informational return. So it's kind of, again, like that tax return or transmittal, they'll file an informational return. They also must provide statements to full-time employees about coverage, all right? So what this does, 6056, again, it only applies to the applicable large employers. So this is centered around compliance with the employer mandate. So 6055 is focused on the individual mandate minimum essential coverage, right? Individual, I want to know, you know, the IRS wants to know, do you have an offer of minimum essential coverage? Okay, right? So, so important there. So 6055, individual mandate. 6056, centered around the applicable large employers. So who is responsible to gather and file these necessary forms. So before we kind of dive into the data here a little bit, I wanted to kind of touch on really the responsibility piece of gathering and filing uh, these specific forms. All right, so a lot uh, might be looking at the picture that will show up here on your screen soon, you know, that, that kind of has a person pointing left and right to him, to her, uh, hopefully not me. <laughs> But who's responsible, really? Uh, hopefully it's not me. But I first am showing 6055 reporting. So under my little IRS uh, logo there, I've, I'm, I've tried to make a headline here to show, okay, I'm talking specifically about 6055 reporting, okay? So again, as I had mentioned, um, under 6055, uh, this is referring to minimum essential coverage. So any person, and this is the language that's used, okay, directly through the IRS, any person that provides minimum essential coverage must report, okay, must do the reporting, okay. That means if a health, if, if, if insured coverage, so if it's a fully insured plan, then a health insurance issuer or carrier would be the reportable entity, okay, for fully insured plans. However, on the flip side, if you have an employer that has self-insured coverage, then the plan sponsor will be responsible for that. So, so as far as 6055 reporting, health insurers, so those plans or your employers that are offering fully insured plans, that's going to be reported by the carrier. If they're self-funded, and you have a lot of small employers that will potentially be self-funded, then they will be required to report this information under 6055. But for most of your small employers um, that are offering fully insured plans, which I would say many uh, are, you know, they will not have to report. It's going to be up to the carrier to, to get that done. So what is... Um, uh, minimum essential coverage, just so you have kind of the information here in regard to, you know, what it is. And this, this is, I just kind of took really the basics of this. Um, the, it's eligible employer-sponsored coverage, clearly. Uh, it includes self-insured plans, COBRA, and let's not forget, you know, retiree coverage. Um, so under, you know, think of COBRA. Think about minimum essential coverage. Don't just think about your current active employees. You need to think about former employees, COBRA employees, retirees. Um, minimum essential coverage affects all of that, depending on that, you know, employer-sponsored coverage. Medicare A and Advantage plans, you know, most Medicaid coverage, a lot of this you guys know, CHIP, most types of TRICARE, um, and I put in the verbiage, you know, and really any other coverage that is deemed necessary uh, to be recognized by HHS <laughs> as minimum essential coverage. Because as you guys might have noticed, it does change a little bit from, from month to month uh, to some degree. Um, so, reporting. 6055, if your employer, and I'm, I'm speaking right now, kind of a small employer, if your employer, or, or even large employer actually right now, um, is offering an insured plan, the health insurance carrier is responsible re for reporting this health coverage on Section 6055, and they're going to use Forms 1094B and 1095B uh, to make that happen. If you have small employers that do offer a self-insured plan, 
okay? And, and think about it, for this year, since the transition for the employer mandate is 100 plus, not 50 plus, whew, you, you could clearly have those groups 50 to 100 that are um, self-insured. So those self-insured plans, the employer is the plan sponsor, and they're responsible for reporting this health coverage, you know, 46055, and they'll do that, again, just like the uh, carrier would for, on forms 1094B and 1095B. All right, so as we transition, as we look at, so go from 6055 to 6056 reporting. So, you know, again, 6055, dealing with minimum essential coverage, um, you know, providers, the fully insured plans, the carrier is responsible for that, great. If you're self-funded, though, and not an applicable large employer, you know, you're going you're gonna to do it on 6055 there as well, okay, as a self-funded plan. Now, on 6056, this, this is focused solely on applicable large employers, okay? So keep that in mind. 6056, applicable large employers only. So they must report, uh, this applies to all employers that are considered applicable large employer members, and that's just the language used in the IRS, and it's regardless of whether the employer is tax exempt or government entity, actually, um, unless you have some other type of an exemption from the employer mandate, um, you are, this applies to everyone, so again, government, uh, for-profit, non-profit, whatever it may be, okay? C-Corp, S-Corp, <laughs> partnership, doesn't matter, all right? It applies to you if you fit that category. So again, just keeping in mind as I have it there, you know, 100 or more full-time employees or equivalents, which you determine in 2014, um, and that will be for 2016. So this applies to um, uh, applicable large employers, okay? So as, as we keep moving, so what's the general method of reporting for uh, an ALE, okay? So what they will report or what they will use for reporting is forms 1094C and 1095C. 1094C is going to be that transmittal form, that informational return, okay, that falls under 6056. 1095C is actually the breakdown of each full-time employee statement. Okay, um, again, these are all in draft form. There are copies of 1094C, 1095C um, that's out there. You can look at it, uh, preview it, but it is all listed as a, as a draft uh, form here um, at the current time. Self-insured plans, okay, so, so you have, um, you've got fully insured plans. You're gonna have large employers, applicable large employers that offer both, right? Self-insured and fully insured. For self-insured plans, the employer will complete 1094C, okay, so they have to do the transmittal form, but they're going to do really all of the sections of 1095C, which will enable them to do a single return. Um, they will not have to do multiple returns, which means that they, they don't actually have to do 6055, okay, by completing both sections in 1095C, that would actually enable them to do a, a single return, okay? So a little simplicity there with that. For insured plans, the employer will complete 1094C and then one section of 1095C. So because you have a fully insured plan, the carrier, the provider, is going to provide that information, but the employer will be required to complete 1094C because that's a transmittal, okay? Um, and then one section of 1095C uh, as well. All right, so let's get into the data requirements here, okay? Um, and as, and I'm, I'm looking over and I'm seeing you guys type in a lot of questions. That is great. Keep it up um, because, again, we will provide answers to you here in our follow-up email um, and provide you with an FAQ on that. So I, I'm looking at some right now, great questions, and I uh, can't wait to respond to those. So what information needs to be gathered? Um, the data requirements, right? So this gets into the granular bleh of, of what this thing is all about, uh, the nuts and bolts, uh, so to speak. All right, so what are we looking at here? So in the upper left-hand corner, I've got 6055 reporting. So under 6055, when you think about most small employers um, that have fully insured plans, they're not going to need to... Um, create this, right? The, the carrier is going to, to uh, submit this, uh, produce this. So, um, but 
For self-insured plans um, for small employers, uh, you will need to complete this information. So the first thing, this is a little more simple, uh, under 6055, uh, you're going to need the name, address, and the employer identification number of the provider. So that would be the carrier, okay, um, in regard to, um, you know, in, in regard to a uh, fully insured plan and certainly plan sponsor um, for self-insured. The enrolled individual's data, that will include name, address, tax ID, so social or tax identification number. But it's also going to, you're going to complete that or they'll complete that for months enrolled in minimum essential coverage and those months that they were entitled to receive benefits. So it's, it's not a crazy amount of detail, but as you think about this, where does this reside? Months enrolled in minimum essential coverage. You know, do you have that information? Is that the carrier? Um, does the employer sit with that? I mean, you need to start thinking about that on where you collect this data as I kind of go through this here a little bit. And it, we'll try to wrap that up here uh, at the end to kind of bring it together. But enrolled individual data includes these items. The name and address and the employer identification number of sponsoring employer. Okay, so sponsoring employer, so that's going to be the employer sponsoring that benefit. And also um, a notation whether that qualified coverage was purchased or, you know, through the shop exchange. Okay, directly through that specific um, item. And then lastly, too, and, and this is even if a carrier is providing this uh, specific because they have a fully insured plan, you know, so they're creating it, you still need to provide a, a, um, a kind of a contact uh, information report that would show um, which is, who is the designated individual if questions arise, okay? Um, so that is important. So as we look at 6055, those items, now there might be, I don't know, a couple things. I tried to put really the, the key major, this is the major stuff that you're going to need to include as part of the 65, 6055 reporting. But in a nutshell, right there, that's what you're looking at. It's not, not terrible, okay, in regard to what you need to try to uh, accumulate. Let's now look at 6056, okay. So, so at least in regard to applicable large employers, um, this is where the rubber meets the road. Um, this is, uh, you know, so pay attention here, at least to this, in regard to, you know, some of the main items here that, that I'm going to address. So again, in the upper left-hand corner, if you ever just want to know what slide we're kind of on, I'm now looking at 6056 uh, reporting. So um, first off, we have to create a statement, right? So we not only have a transmittal that is kind of your individual return, so the tax return, if you will, uh, to the IRS, but we have this statement. So the statement to all full-time employees, it's going to include the name, address, um, the employer identification number of the employer, okay, the applicable large employer member. You also then have the ability of um, uh, what they're going to provide within this form is an ability for an employer to um, choose to elect kind of an optional method of simplified reporting. Now I'm going to show you on the next slides um, the data that's needed for each of these forms. It's pretty detailed in regard to each employee, okay? But there will be an opportunity, and I guess I can only say because there's a draft form, I, I don't have the firm instructions yet in regard to how an employer chooses this, but let me try to give you an example. Um, so if, if an employer had the ability to um, simplify, so instead of writing out all this data for each and every employee, you know, the months covered, what type of coverage did they have, um, I mean, literally just providing each, all the information for every employee. What if you could just check off a box where the employer is confirming that, listen, I've identified whoever is a full-time employee. I have offered minimum essential coverage to all of those employees, and it's affordable uh, to at least 98% of all of its employees. You know, so, so basically what these qualifying offer methods will be is a way for an employer to somewhat bypass maybe some of that crazy detail, um, but I don't have all the details here just yet uh, to potentially give you as to what those things look like, and those things might change. Um, so I don't want to go too heavy into that, but there might be a way for um, at least several employers anyway to be able to kind of bypass some of the redundancy, you know, in the information that they have to um, uh, create. Part three of the 1090 
1095C uh, reporting. So that's part three of that. There's there's three parts. Really gets into the details, 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 details uh, of it. Um, and I've kind of highlighted here the um, the key bullets of of information. Now, each one of these, there's there's a lot of well, there's just a lot of information with with all of these bullets here. But you do need to provide a listing of all the months that as an employer, as an applicable large employer member, that you offered minimum essential coverage, okay? Now, generally speaking, it's going to be for the whole year, right? You know, calendar year, plan year, what have you. You're going to need a full-time employee count for each month. You're going to need a total employee count for each month. You will then need to split that up in regard to each employee. So in creating kind of that statement, the full-time employee name, the tax ID number, date of birth, and the months covered for each. Okay, so depending on new hires that come in that are considered full-time, uh, you know, did they have coverage just from March through the end of the year, so on and so forth. So you'll need to do that for each one. And then lastly, and it's simple, uh, you know, but the employee's share of the lowest cost monthly premium for self-only coverage, okay? Um, now, you know, the only difference there is if you've got a, you know, kind of a plan year that starts in March, well, you know, did you change your plan? Did the lowest cost monthly premium change between January and February and March? You know, I mean, so just knowing those kind of level of details. As you look above there in the full-time employee count, the total employee count, I mean, where can you get that information? Think about that. Um, you know, payroll providers such as Prime Pay. All right, so payroll. Uh, we certainly have full-time employee count. We probably have a total employee count as well. But you just need to think about, you know, where are the carriers? How do the carriers? How are they spawn, uh, respond? How will they provide some of this information? You may not be able to get all of it from the carrier because they're not going to know the full-time employee count, right? I mean, they're just looking at benefit enrolled in essence, uh, types of employees. Um, so, so having kind of that full-time employee count is going to become very important as it relates to maybe the payroll side or benefit administration system or technology that, that an employer may be using. So reporting deadlines, um, how and when do you report this required information? Um, let's, let's look at this here. There's two things that I want to focus on in regard to, um, this, is, this applies to both 6055 and 6056, okay? And there's really, again, kind of two key action items for employers and or for other providers or other carriers that need to submit 6055. The healthcare coverage provider either must file or they must furnish something. So first off, they need to file a return. So they're going to need to file an information return on 1095B, okay? Um, the transmittal form is going to be on 1094B. So the deadline, and I don't believe this is a misprint, uh, it is indeed a leap year next year. <laughs> so the deadline is February 29th, 2016. Uh, or March 31st if filed electronically. And so um, very similar in nature to the standard uh, deadlines for W-2 reporting, okay? So you'll see kind of similar results here. Um, so that filing needs to be done by February 29th. But the health coverage provider must also furnish the statement, okay? So to the enrolled individual on or before January 31st. So that statement will need to be triggered and sent. Uh, that can be sent by mail, uh, could be sent electronically as long as they receive consent to receive it in that fashion. So uh, for 6055, generally this, these two action items will be taken care of by um, uh, by the carrier because it's a fully insured plan. But if you've got self-funded um, employers, they will be responsible for this. 6056, so very similar. Again, though, now we're now focused on the applicable large employer, um, okay, for 6056. So they must file a return for each employee, so that's 1095C. They must also uh, file the transmittal form. That's the return. I mean, that's the return, um, kind of like the tax return, uh, 1094C. Uh, deadlines are the same. You'll see here that applicable large employers with more than 250 returns, okay, so 250 individual returns, all right, must file electronically. And then the applicable large employer must furnish 
um, they must furnish um, a statement to each full-time employee on or before January 2016, all right? Stating coverage was or was not offered, all right? You can have full-time employees that, that are eligible for benefits and coverage was offered, but they didn't take it, right? So, I mean, all those things need to be uh, notated. And then statements sent by mail or electronically. I just glanced over and saw one of the questions uh, just in regard to, hey, shouldn't this already be done? Uh, here for this year, do you mean February or January of 2015? Nope. There was some transitional relief for last year. Um, it was voluntary. Uh, so employers that wished to uh, start or begin doing the information reporting, they could, uh, but that was completely voluntary. So um, I'm only speaking to kind of what's required now under the rules. So the first official requirement of filing will be the dates that I have listed here. So January 31st for the employee statement, and then uh, February 29th or March 31st of, uh, if filed electronically for the returns. But that's a great question, a lot of confusion there. So what about penalties, though? I mean, we have... Uh, do we have, do we have penalties? If if I, if I if I could care less and don't do anything, do I care? Um, all right. Well, you should care. <laughs> all right. Um, but there was some relief. There is some good news. Okay. Um, there actually some good news. So notice 2013-45. I put that up there. You can look through that. It did provide transitional relief for 2014. So that person who asked that question about, well, hey, isn't it due now? That provided the relief to say, hey, it's voluntary, guys. If you want to do it, great, but you're not required to do it at this time. Secondarily, though, here in my second bullet point, though, is that the IRS has made a statement, and they have said that applicable large employers that have made a good faith effort to comply with these information reporting requirements in filing the 2015 return, which is next January, you know, February, that they will find penalty relief. I mean, if they by chance made an error, you know, of some kind uh, just in, in their return. So basically what they're saying is, look, if, if you can get your employers working on, um, you know, in getting this done, getting it completed, I, I don't really see a penalty, you know, here as we go into their filing requirements. But the penalties are this, just so you guys know, the penalties fall under section 67, 21, and 22. And it's the standard stuff, okay? You know, failing to file timely returns, failure to include all the required information, um, or incorrect information, so on and so forth. The penalty starts at $100 per return, or in the bottom section, 67, 22, $100 per statement. So if you've got 150 employees and you failed to furnish a timely statement, the penalty can be $100 per that 150, up to a maximum penalty of $1.5 million. So I suggest <laughs> you have that conversation and we look at getting your applicable large employers making a good faith effort <laughs> to comply. How's that? <laughs> All right. Um, so just a recap here, summary of requirements as we're nearing the end here. Um, just a quick recap here of 6055. All right, uh, and hopefully I've re reiterated this uh, here enough. Um, if you have an insured plan, you're a small employer, and you have an insured plan, the carrier is going to be the one responsible. So if it's insured, the insurer is responsible for that reporting. If it's self-insured, the employer is responsible. And, and basically for employers, uh, it, will be, it will flow under 1094C and 1095C. For insurers, it's 1094B <laughs> and 1095B, okay? So just, just so you have kind of a quick, quick easy page here reflecting what, uh, what they would need to um, uh, create in what form. Under 6056, a little more simplistic. Um, but really focused, again, on applicable large employers, and they're going to file that under Forms 1094-C and 1095-C. And so just depending on whether they're fully insured or self-insured, they might have to complete all of 1095, you know, see all the sections, or only the portion that they need to, and then the carrier will, will do the rest. 
So as, as you think as you think about all that I just kind of threw at you there, um, I don't. Maybe your client is is that picture right there. You know, how can you help your employer? Are they out there begging <laughs> right now? I mean, I don't know if they have a little little begging jar, tip jar there, but um, you know. I am sure they're asking, how can you help, help me, you know, with this specific uh, reporting? So we want to focus here a little bit on just employer collaboration. And, and to some degree, I don't know if I have all the answers here for you, um, but I hopefully can kind of point you in the right direction where some of those answers can be. As we went through all the data components um, of information, um, there's a lot here. And, and I kind of I tried to help direct you as I was going through it as far as, well, what specific, um, you know, as I list that data, where do you think you can find it? Where can you get it? Um, how can you obtain it? I mean, at the end of the day, guys and gals, we, you've got to figure out a way to drive a value-added service and benefit to your employers. You might say as an agency, you know what, I don't even want to touch this. <laughs> Holy cow, I don't even want to go there. But I think your employers are, are going to be desiring for you to, to be more involved than maybe you want to be. And, and actually, as I've gone through the list, I mean, I know there's a lot of data there, but I think you'll find, it, I mean, it's not terrible. It's really not. Okay? I mean, once you have a, a system in place to kind of capture that, uh, I don't know if it's that difficult, okay, to do. But some questions that I think you're going to want to ask um, are some of these. Um, and as you think about your involvement in, in these particular tasks, um, you know, how far do you want to go? with it, you know, what information do you collect as an agency currently? I mean, you collect a lot of census information, you collect a lot of benefit eligible information, but, but what, do you, what do you often collect already in some of the information that I've given you that you could actually either provide to your client or at least start a repository, you know, a greater repository of information. Maybe you're using a benefit administration platform that it could be entered into or, or what have you, but what are you collecting already? What information could be gleaned from the carrier? Um, and clearly, uh, the carrier has a tremendous amount of information as far as who's enrolled um, for what month and so forth. So there could be some great information that can be gathered and, and gleaned from the carrier here already. But what information is that based on what I showed you? And then what information does the employer already maintain? You know, there, there's some things that you don't get involved with necessarily on a daily basis in regard to payroll, you know, functionality and, and the, the, the provider that they're working with and how they're using their, their payroll, um, you know, provider. Well, I, you're going to want to start asking those questions. Well, hey, who do you use? Okay, if you're using Prime Pay, what are they doing, you know, in, in that specific thing? So you're going to want to understand, you know, I mean, you kind of know already what the information has, but, but maybe what direction are they thinking about in regard to um, this particular reporting? What I also want you to consider that can be of, of huge assistance for you and the client is using technology, right, to your advantage. Um, I, I've labeled three key um, kind of items that I think would be helpful in maintaining or driving uh, support of this requirement, and you can find this in benefit administration systems, so Ben Admin systems, you know, these benefit enrollment systems that will capture not only employee information, dependent information, you know, months enrolled, I mean, a lot of that can be gathered and maintained as a repository there. Uh, you also might want to consider payroll providers. I know Prime Pay is, um, you know, as, as this is becoming final, you know, Prime Pay is determining its really full scope of how it will support our clients through this because a lot of this great data that's needed for the, um, for the information returns uh, is going to be garnered through um, the payroll. So how, are, how will payroll providers kind of be engaged? And then lastly, and, and it's not, it's really cool, maybe technology, I don't know if it's the best, but it is a, a solution, but you've got third-party software providers, right? And, and a lot of that information, it's, it's outside the scope of payroll and Ben Admin systems, it kind of stands alone. And so it's static information, not that it's bad information, but you always have to update that information. So that way you've got good, good information going in so that your good reports are coming out. But third-party providers, our are, 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 uh, software providers are popping up all over the place um, in regard to that. Um, and, and the main thing, though, you know, we do have 
we do have some time, we do, but but really we need to begin developing a plan right now. And, and I just um, implore you all to begin discussing this with your clients now. Don't wait. Um, begin having this conversation as, um, as hard, maybe, this, this, this conversation might be to have with your clients. It's so needed, and I think that it can really showcase um, the strength of, of your work, your agency, you know, your knowledge, your expertise, the partnerships that you've created, and we're here certainly to help. So with that, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of information that I just uh, shared with you, and, and that really uh, at least kind of ends the, the main content here of our webinar here today. What we will be providing you, and I've gotten several questions just in regard to, you know, are we getting a uh, pre copy of the presentation? Absolutely. That will be coming in a follow-up email. What we also will be providing you is what I've shown you here on the screen as well. It's, it's, a, it's actually, um, it's kind of a smart document that you'll look at the specific questions of the reporting, you click on it, and it'll go to that specific answer. So this is a great FAQ. Um, it's pulled uh, primarily directly from the IRS and their FAQ, um, but this document will help kind of uh, hopefully make it a little easier to find your answers quickly. Um, and um, so we will be delivering this to you as well. And as always, uh, this is being recorded and it is posted to our YouTube channel, Broker Concierge YouTube channel. Um, and I suggest please go there here in a couple days and that will be posted and available for your viewing. Um, with that, um, I can't thank you enough for attending our webinar today. I hope that as detailed as I get sometimes, and, and of course the regulation states that it needs to be detailed, but I hope that I was able to bring some, um, some real strong value add for you that you can go out to your clients here, you know, maybe this afternoon, and be able to talk to your clients uh, more intelligently about what their requirement will be with this important regulation. So with that, I uh, can't thank you enough for taking time out of your busy schedules to sit with us. That will conclude our webinar for today. Happy New Year, and we look forward to what this year will bring. Take care.